Coming up on Tech News Today, Apple's got Burberry to cover or something. Announcements galore. Also, Google's watch got more rumors coming out. We'll tell you a little bit about that. And Amazon is invading Procter & Gamble's warehouses for your benefit. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, October 15th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website, portfolio, or online store. For a free trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT10. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zachar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show that takes all of the tech news in the world in its loving embrace and then pushes a bunch of it out as irrelevant and tells you only the important stuff, starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. Sony is now selling its Xperia Z1. Oh, wait, it's the U.S. Xperia Z1 and Xperia Z Ultra smartphones in the U.S., along with its smartwatch, too. The phones don't have deals with carriers, so you got to pay full price, but that also means they're unlocked. The 5-inch 1920 by 1080 water-resistant Xperia Z1 with the 20.7 megapixel camera is $669.99. The 6.44-inch Z Ultra is $649.99 for the non-LTE version and $679.99 for the LTE model. And the smartwatch, too, runs $199.99. Well, it's official. Apple has confirmed next Tuesday as, well, they don't actually say, but it's basically, probably, most likely new iPads and maybe new MacBooks. All the company is saying is, we still have a lot to cover in the invite that went out with some colorful Apple Leaf art. Also this morning, Apple announced it's hired Angela Arendt, the CEO of Burberry, to lead the Apple retail and online stores strategic direction, expansion, and operation. She'll join Apple in the spring of next year, filling a gap in the company's executive team. Arendt has been an executive in the fashion industry since the mid-80s. Twitter is rolling out a new feature that will allow you to receive direct messages from anyone who follows you, even if you don't follow them back. Now, in the past, you'd have to follow each other to have a DM conversation. This new DM feature is opt-in. The next web says it will still be possible to block people from DMing you if you, uh, even if you opt into this feature. In the latest leaked documents from Edward Snowden, the Washington Post reports the U.S. National Security Agency collects contact lists from personal email and instant messaging accounts around the world, including some that belong to U.S. citizens. The lists are intercepted when they are broadcast by programs during login. Agency uses them to map connections between individuals. The collection is made possible through the cooperation of arrangements with foreign Internet service providers, telecommunication companies, and allied intelligence services. Yahoo has confirmed to the Washington Post that it will turn on HTTPS encryption by default for Yahoo Mail starting on January 8th, 2014. The security upgrade happens exactly a year after Yahoo first rolled out an SSL encryption feature for its mail service. Google and Microsoft have been offering HTTPS as a default for years, so, you know, there's that. Yeah, Yahoo. <laughs> Yesterday, Lavabit announced it will reopen for a short time so users can get their data. A service will be restored for a 72-hour period that began 5 o'clock Pacific time yesterday, October 14th. That's 5 p.m. Uh, Lavabit was the encrypted email service that was linked to Edward Snowden, and the service shut down way back in August. With all the surveillance talk, you may wonder if the government could come for your Snapchat. Yes, some of you may actually worry about that. The others of you stop laughing at them. Snapchat Trust and Safety Officer Mike uh, Schaefer wrote a blog post explaining that the company can only turn over unopened messages, and they have done it in response to a search warrant 12 times. Before you relax too much, though, keep in mind an app called SnapHack from Darren Jones has hit the scene, making it easy for your friends to save and republish Snapchat messages without notifying the sender. The app is most likely in violation of Snapchat's terms of service. The Electronic Frontier Foundation called out Google for vague banning of the use of servers on its fiber service. 
And now the company seems to be reversing its stance. Google will allow, quote, personal, non-commercial use of servers that complies with the AUP is acceptable, including using virtual private networks to access services in your home and using hardware or applications that include server capabilities for uses like multiplayer gaming, video conferencing, and home security. So thanks for complaining, EFF. Anytime. Seth Weintraub at 9 to 5 Google has more anonymous info that Google is making a watch. His sources say Google Now would be at the center of the product. Google is focusing on longer battery life and Bluetooth 4.0 connectivity. As Weintraub points out, Artem Rusakovsky previously reported Google's watch, codenamed Gem, would run KitKat and come October 31st, along with the release of that flavor of Android. In any case, Google's likely to have something come from their acquisition of smartwatch SDK developer Wim last year, and we were expecting it soon. Oh, Jim is so outrageous. Rovia will be releasing Angry Birds Go, a kart racing game. If you've ever played Mario Kart, you have a pretty good idea of what Angry Birds Go is like. The game will be released on December 11th on iOS and Android. Angry Birds Go will also be free to play with upgradable cars and stunt tracks. Well, that looks this fun. episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the all-in-one platform that makes it easy to create your own professional website, portfolio, or online store. They are constantly improving their platform. We talk about their beautiful designs, and they are beautiful, how easy it is to use. I use it all the time on my own sites. makes it easy to update things. It's only $8 a month, including a free domain name if you pay for a year. It's mobile-optimized. But we don't talk enough about how commerce-ready it is, which is a businessy way for you business types to know you can start a freaking store on Squarespace. It's integrated to work with every Squarespace template, allowing sales for physical and digital goods. You can sell CDs and MP3s, both if you want. Hardcover books or eBooks or both. Single interface for order management, tracking orders, customizable customer email updates, print shipping labels, add coupons, and it's global. You put a store on Squarespace Commerce, you're available in 10 countries. The United States, UK, Canada, Australia, Belgium, France, Germany, Ireland, the Netherlands, and Spain. You don't have to take my word for it. Go start a trial. No credit card required. Start building up your website. Investigate these features. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use offer code TNT10 to get 10% off and to show your support for Tech News Today. And we thank Squarespace for their continuing support of Tech News Today. Hope you do too. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. And now we're going to create an exceptional roundtable discussion by bringing in Miriam Joir, product evangelist for Pebble and mobile coverage person extraordinaire. How's it going, Miriam? Hey, I'm well. How are you guys? Um, ah, there's the camera. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us. I know you've been playing around with the HTC uh, One Max. We're going to talk about that a little later on. Yeah, let's, right uh, here. Oh, cool. Yeah. It, we'll have to do a size comparison of some sort with that thing. It's ridiculous. It's, it's like, gargantuan, isn't it's it? It's absolutely ridiculous. All right. We'll get to that in a little bit. Let's start off with a little bit of this Apple news. Uh, I may be mashing up the story, Sarah, but uh, Apple will be launching new Burberry colored iPad covers. Is that right? That's exactly right. On Tuesday, okay, we can look forward to a lot of that that, that signature Burberry pattern on everything Apple. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, two things happened this morning that are that are both pretty big. Apple did say, yeah, yeah, okay, that Tuesday, uh, that Tuesday announcement. I think it was uh, All Things D who originally said this is yeah. when it's going to be has been confirmed. We've got some uh, announcement artwork that doesn't really say much, but yes, Tom, you made a joke on Twitter this morning that it looks <laughs> like smart covers because they have a lot more to cover is what they said, and you see some colorful Apple leaves on the invitation. But we don't really know anything from Apple yet, but hey, that's happening a week from today. But uh, what is for sure is that Apple has hired Angela Arendt, current CEO of Burberry, or I guess she's she's the exiting CEO of Burberry, mm -hmm. to lead Apple retail and online stores, strategic direction, expansion, and operation. She's not joining Apple officially until spring of 2014, She's also not replacing anybody. She's actually filling an executive hole that's been there for quite a while now. Well, what's interesting is that not only is she the, I guess, third now in a line of people from the fashion industry that Apple's hired, but she's been in the fashion industry her whole career. In fact, she became president of Donna Karen International 
1989, uh, at a somewhat young age, she was 29 years old at that point, she joined the executive board of Liz Claiborne, which is now called Fifth and Pacific. In 1998, she joined Burberry as CEO in 2006. Anybody who follows fashion close enough to know how these large uh, companies do, many credit her for turning around Burberry. Uh, at one point, it was in danger of you know, some sort of a diluted uh, selling off of, of parts of the brand and, and uh, under her direction, it's definitely come back. So I mentioned the other folks from the fashion industry. There's Paul Deneuve, who's the former CEO and president of Yves Saint Laurent. Back in July, Apple brought him in. Um, and he, we, everybody said, oh, he's going to be the new retail guy, but actually he's VP in charge of special projects. And then Enrique Atienza, SVP uh, at Levi's, who's going to lead up Apple's U.S. retail efforts, but not global ones. In an internal memo to employees, Tim Cook uh, told everybody about them hiring Angela Arendt, called her wicked smart. So there's that. I can't imagine this has too much impact on what's happening next week. That's probably been set in stone for a while. But what do we think, Miriam? What is with all these fashion people? I don't know. You know, Apple's always been a fashionable company, right? So maybe um, they're really getting serious about it now <laughs> or something. Um, I don't know. I think that I'm actually very surprised by all this. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, obviously, um, you know, Apple... Maybe they're perce they perceive that their their retail space is a little stale. And I don't mean stale in a bad way because I think I have still enjoy myself going to the Apple store a lot. But it's changed a lot since the early days, right? It's always packed. And the design, the interior, the looks haven't really changed. I think the architecture has always been very exciting and compelling in terms of the glass and all that. But I think as far as... Um, you know, the, the, the way the, the furniture and the layout and stuff looks. Maybe they're trying to spice it up by hiring these people. I'm not exactly sure how to take this, frankly. Yeah, it's like they're collecting CEOs or something. I mean, it's, I, I guess it makes sense that Apple is seen as a stylish tech product by many people. And if Apple wants to push that perspective forward, they would get people who know how to market stylish things and, and have retail experience to run their retail shop. But I, I don't know what to expect from that either. I would think it's because how how much these devices are commodities at this point. If you're going to sell a shirt with a pattern or a scarf with a pattern, and you can mark it up like crazy, like Burberry can, if they can somehow continue to have that cult-like feel around Apple where you have their products and they stand out, even though you can get like a Nexus 7 for cheap, versus an iPad. A lot of these devices have gotten very, very similar. So if, if the only way to really differentiate yourselves at this point is your store, and everybody has copied Apple's stores, so they have to have this way to somehow make their products seem desirable, even though pretty much every company can make the same thing at this point because there's so much competition. Yeah, the well, other maybe, thought I... Sorry? Yeah, go ahead, Mary. I was saying the other thought I had is perhaps, you know, they're getting going to get, I mean, you know, I work for Pebble. Uh, it's a wearable company. We do, we make a really awesome watch. And I'm thinking maybe Apple's, maybe these rumors are right. Maybe they, they feel that they need fashion people to get a wearable device out on the market. And this would then make a bit more sense, you know. Um, I never really thought of them. I mean, to me, Jonathan Ive is the guy doing the design at Apple, but perhaps um, you know, they, they've been hired to, to assist with some of, some of not the design, but maybe to, you know, kind of help with some brainstorm in terms of um, the kind of fashion side of, of consumer electronics for all I know. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, I mean, especially considering, as you well know, working for Pebble now, the, the look of a watch device is so much more important to people when they evaluate it, when they react to it, uh, than, than maybe it is with a, with a phone where we've kind of got used to them all being little black slabs. And we have, we have that uh, rumor that we heard about in the news fuse about Google possibly coming out with their watch soon. Ayaz, tell us a little more about that. Yeah, so 9 to 5 Google is saying Google's putting the finishing touches on a, on a watch product. It's sources say that Google now could be at the center of this watch. Uh, Google wants long battery life out of the device. They're apparently going to be using Bluetooth 4.0. Not a whole lot of details about the actual watch as a, as a form factor. Uh, Artem Rosikovsky, great name, of Android Police, 
did talk about the Nexus. It's called it a Nexus watch, likely together with uh, the KitKat announcement. This would be released. Uh, the date that Rosakowski had was October 31st for the release, although he said that date was a month old. He's had it for a while. Uh, nine to five Google sources say to expect the watch sooner rather than later. Miriam, do you think a Google Now centric watch is the right approach for something like a smartwatch? Well, I don't think it's the right approach for per se myself, but I think it would be a very compelling approach. I'm a Google Glass user, I'm an explorer, and I really love the idea of, um, first of all, I love the idea of Google Now. I think Google Now has changed my life. I think it's incredibly well done. Uh, I think there's a lot of people have issues with it, but I really, look, I'm. it's been so positive an experience for me that I'm willing to put aside some of my concerns around my privacy and gathering information about me, because it just really is such a compelling experience. So. For me, Glass has been an awesome experience because of that. But obviously, you know, the limitations of the technology around Glass make it still very clunky and experimental. A watch, however, would probably make it a more likely candidate uh, to use Google Now cards, right? That being said, I mean, you know, our perspective at Pebble has always been that, you know, there are some things our watch does that, you know, the gear doesn't do, for example. You know, it's water resistant. You can swim with it, like five atmospheres, 150 feet or so. You know, it's got about seven-day battery life. And those things, the feedback we're getting from our customers is that those are the critical things that really make a watch for them. Um, and so, you know... Certainly, we've had to make some compromises like, you know, we don't have a touch screen, although that's kind of by choice because, you know, you can accidentally tap things, especially when you're doing a lot of activity related uh, kind of exercise. Um, but but also, you know, the, the display is only uh, it's, it's e-paper, but it's permanently on. You don't have to do anything to read the time. So I think with Google's deep coffers, I could see, you know, a device that would deliver Google Now cards and do it in a battery efficient and waterproof manner. I, I don't know if they're going to pull it off. It, it has to be priced at a reasonable thing. To, to me, a watch, and I think this is Pebble's philosophy, it's an accessory, right? It's not your main computing device. And it's not meant to be a full computer on your wrist in, in the sense of a phone today be, being pretty much a full computer. And, you know, that that's our approach. And we want to keep it simple. We want to keep it accessible. Um, I'm not convinced for the average consumer, unless they do it in a very slick way, like Apple's been known to be very good at, at user interface and user experience, unless Google can pull that off in terms of UI and UX, I'm not quite sure the average consumer out there is ready for a Google Now Watch, but that's just me. I think the us, the tech savvy people are, but you know, working at Pebble as a product person has kind of enlightened me to what the average person wants and what they're looking for. And they want simplicity, you know? So we'll see. I, if you just decided, maybe like maybe if you just take it at the the what Google now is really good at, and that's timing and calendar based stuff. So not just what's coming up, but what you may want to know about before you ask it based on your past history. That does seem like a good fit for a watch. You know, it's like, what time is it? What am I gonna do next? Uh, what may I want to check in on that I haven't thought of yet type of a thing. I kind of like that if it, if it, if it's, if it's focused enough, then maybe the watch won't seem so limited. It will just seem like, okay, it's hyper-focused on a certain part of what something right. like a smartphone gives us. That's what we do at Pebble, right? It's just notifications and watch faces at this point, you know? So... All right, let's shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about retail. Don't don't go away. This is actually really interesting. Amazon, Wall Street Journal report says, is operating inside of other retailers' warehouses, something called Vendor Flex. Actually, it's going right to the product sources, so it's not retailers per se. It's, uh, in this case, Procter & Gamble, P&G. Workers load pallets with products for Amazon customers and then go to a fenced off area in the P&G warehouse where Amazon employees take them, package them up and ship them directly out of the warehouse. So it's solving part of the supply chain. There's no taking it from the Procter & Gamble warehouse, bringing it over to Amazon and then having Amazon have to take it inside, pack it up and then send it back out again. This is a way to save money on low price high volume staples, things like diapers, things like household uh, paper items and soaps and things that are bulky and cheap, which make direct shipping a problem uh, because of the because of the shipping cost of them. An example uh, that I found today, ivory soap. It's an add on item. You can't buy it alone. 
from Amazon because they're like, it just doesn't make sense. We get, we're only going to send this to you if you're buying something else that we can throw it in the box with. Uh, so the, if this works out, if they're able to make this happen, make this make sense for them, TechCrunch at least uh, suspects maybe we could see them move on to, to bakers and to farms and, and, and bringing stuff directly from the person who's making it to you. Miriam, does this get your imagination running at all? I mean, could, could you see this uh, changing the way we buy things? Possibly. I mean, I'm I'm not sure. Like, I'm I'm not a good person to ask about retail purchases. To be frank, um, well, you know, when I worked at Engadget, I pretty much got everything I ever wanted to play with for free for a while. So I really haven't bought stuff so very much in the last three years. <laughs> Paper okay, towels. So, uh, yeah, that's the kind of stuff know, we're talking about. I know, but I mean, the retail experience for me has been broken for a long time. You know, I I first of all think that. Every chance I get, I will I will buy things just sitting at home, and if I have to go out to buy something, um, I'm very frustrated with the experience every single time. I mean, where are our sci-fi supermarkets where you just walk in, and you pick stuff off the shelves and walk out, and it's automatically debited to your account? I mean, right? Yeah. I that, I'm waiting for that, too. I remember that commercial that they ran where, where the guy did that, and it showed it. We're not that far off, but I almost would rather have this where – cheaply it may be even less expensive than going to the store because they don't have to bring it in and stock it i can have yeah. these sort of annoying things just sent to me and if they can make yeah, that work i sure. like that. It's kind of subscription based yeah I, I i think you know i think any experiment in the space is welcome i think that because the model is broken as we know it today we should certainly look at uh, other solutions and this is definitely a step you know it's definitely a step worth exploring I'm just not, you know, I'm not like excited about it or anything. Right, you don't get excited about buying toilet paper. Neither do I. I, I <laughs> Nobody does, takes, right? I mean, does <laughs> exactly. Anyone? Really? But that, that that's what I think is exciting is about is the idea of not having to think about this as much. Uh, because I do buy some of this stuff. I just bought razor blades on Amazon. And that's one of the things they've kind of figured out, even though it's one of those low margin bulky items. Uh, and there's lots of subscription services that will just send you those things like man packs. It's a, they're an advertiser here on Twit. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, I think the idea of being able to get more direct from the pro producer thing is a good idea. Although... It worries me a little, is Amazon getting too much power here if they're the ones inside of all of the warehouses here? Do they become the new Walmart and that they're the ones that are, are dominating the industry and dictating prices? It seems weird that Amazon would be sending its own staff to Procter & Gamble facilities. It just seems like, why do, you, do they need their own people there if they can just ship it over? It's, it, it does seem like Amazon, not, not necessarily a power grab, but to be in these facilities and have their basically a warehouse within a warehouse kind of concept, it just seems like a very unusual step. I don't know if I've ever heard of any, any other companies trying this, and I'm not sure what kind of – obviously, Amazon thinks this is going to make them a lot more money, so they have some, some way to do this, but it just seems very strange to go, okay, Amazon staff, you go to that facility now. All right, let's uh, move on to Twitter and their risky business of allowing everyone <laughs> to DM you. I think yeah, there's sorry, a reason for this, uh, but how's it going to work, Sarah? I, I wasn't uh, paying attention to, uh, to to the Amazon story because I was too busy checking my DMs from people I don't follow. Actually, so the the idea is, is that I woke up to like a, a frenzy in my Twitter feed. Of course, people on Twitter love talking about Twitter features, so it's not necessarily that big of a deal outside of Twitter, but... Twitter has now given you an option to be able to receive direct messages, meaning private messages that aren't in the public Twitter stream from people that you don't follow. Now, up until this point, it always had to be a, if I follow Tom, then uh, I can't necessarily DM him unless he follows me back. Now, over the years, we've probably all seen those kind of passive aggressive tweets from people saying like, I'd love to send you my address, but you don't follow me, so I can't DM you mm, because it kind of has to be a two-way thing. So, okay, it solves that issue, I guess. Um, I actually quietly turned on uh, DMs from people I don't follow this morning just to see if any, uh -oh. any would come now through. I, well, I didn't want to, like, say, I'm going <laughs> to turn them on during the show because now I'm going to get, you know, silly stuff from people just because, you know, they they because we're on the show, but I didn't get one. So it's not as if like I'm getting spam, you know, in the first five hours of, of, of knowing about this feature. But what's kind of interesting is back in 2011, Twitter uh, gave a statement to the next web that said, 
We've given a limited number of accounts the ability to receive DMs from accounts they don't follow in cases where having that capability may be beneficial, like enabling businesses to receive account information that users may not want to post publicly. I don't really remember Twitter saying that a couple of years ago, but I think, oh, you know, that would be really good in a case where, let's say, you know, I was complaining about bad customer service with Comcast yesterday. If I get to a point where I am engaging with somebody, you know, that's running the Comcast social media account, we might want to move it to DM because I might need to give them information that's just not right for the tweet stream, but I don't really want to follow that account in order to do so. So that kind of makes sense. But then you've got people saying, well, hold on here. This is a feature that is off by default, so there's no need to freak out. But if you turn it on by default, would this be the first step in maybe getting DMs from brands you follow, which could probably turn into a lot of advertising, i.e. spam, in your DM stream? Miriam, do you think that this is the beginning of something that would be on by default rather than off? Oh, I hope it's not on by default. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm torn on this. I mean, it's like it's like sometimes I've had people try to reach me, you know, and it was important, right? And I for some reason wasn't following them. But most of the time it's like there's no way I'd want people like just to randomly DM me. It's, it's more noise, right? I mean, more potential noise. And I don't know. I, I just don't think it's a good idea. I'm I, I'm very happy with the way DMing works today. And and is is there's ways around the you know uh, the fact that people aren't you know following you. Um, sorry that you're not following them. You can always like negotiate something in the in the public part of of um, of Twitter. That's that's kind of what I've liked about it. There's kind of a public discussion. I mean, think about it. you're in a restaurant. To me, Twitter is the analogy is in your restaurant, right? You have all these conversations going on in public. And so, you know, you could kind of yell over the shoulder of someone else and say, hey, you know, can I talk to you in private over there? And, you know, they can say yes. And then you add each other and then you do, you go over there in, the, in, in another room and you talk, right? And that's your DM. And to me, that analogy works. And not having that anymore is just like, I mean, have them trying to remove that option, I guess, or trying to add that new option is, is kind of breaking that to me. But that's, you know... Maybe I'm old fashioned about this stuff. I don't know. I'm just not excited about it. I want the ability to let people direct message me when I don't want to follow them. I want that because there are times when, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm talking with an account representative from, from my telephone company, my, my mobile phone company. I don't want to follow them, but I do want them to be able to DM me. So to being able to turn it on in individual situations, I would like. This seems like a little ham-handed right now because you kind of have to turn it on from it for everyone and then block them. Do I have that right, Sarah? Uh, yeah. I mean, if you block somebody, you're, they're not going to be able to DM you. But, but you know, that's that's. But I can't least just turn it on for block. one person at a time, right? I've got to turn it on Correct. for everybody. Okay. Correct. You turn on the fire hose of DMs, and then if you've got an issue with somebody, you selectively block. By the See, way, what? since I mentioned that my DMs were on, I've gotten two DMs. So oh, not maybe bad, not actually. that crazy. <laughs> right. It's not too bad. Uh, not too you know, bad. here's something they should have done, which I think would have worked better, is um, you you could enable, instead of like allowing, you know, following someone and then they can DM you, um, what if you can put them on like follow for a certain amount of time? So, for example, if it's a rep, you can ask, you can, you know, let them DM you like for that. like a week. Yeah, yeah. Say like, That's, okay, to I need much I need, more manageable. Yeah, the next few days, I need I need to hear from this person, and then I can renew it if the conversation needs to. I like yeah. that. That's 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 brilliant. I mean, that's the solution to the problem because I mean, the situation you described has happened to me. You know, because some cause CS rep um, that yeah, I need right. to talk to, but it's not going to last forever, and I certainly don't want them randomly messaging me with some spam a month from now. <laughs> Where do know. you turn this on? I'm actually paging through the Twitter settings right now. I can't find it. Uh, it's just it's your it's your settings, and then no. um, right. it's the same screen where you can turn on that, you know, you want to uh, download all your tweets as a, as an archive. It's in there, Tom. I'll, I'll, I'll start paying Find attention it. to the show instead of looking Find at Twitter it. settings. Let's, uh, 
Let's go to, to Ayaz's story about Aviate. This is cool app for Android users if you don't want to spend a lot of time managing your home screen. Yeah, so it's it's a new launcher. Now, it was out in alpha a while ago. Now, it's available as a public beta. It's called Aviate. And what it does, it reconfigures your Android home screen based on your current context. So Aviate looks at where you are, your movement, your activity. So if you're like at work, you'll have business apps like Gmail, Calendar, and Drive at the forefront. Uh, the, ho the work home screen also has widgets showing you your schedule, as well as shortcuts to sending email and, uh, and creating a new event. At the Aviate site, they have a video where they show how how this home screen looks. It looks a bit like cards. There's a lot more. Uh, it, it does a lot of the work for you. It, it collects your apps by social or work, and these different kinds of contexts as well. Uh, swiping to the side reveals a list that lets you move between contexts, like I mentioned, work nearby places, going somewhere. Apps are sorted by collections. There are uh, also, if you want your apps in one giant list, they still have that as well. You can download the app right now, but you need to get an invite from Aviate to kind of do the mailbox kind of thing where you can actually get the app, but you can't actually use it until you use a code or something like that. Amir, what do you think of Aviate's presentation of information? Is this, this, is this the way that uh, you want to interact with your Android device? Um, I haven't really played with it, to be honest. I'd, I'd really have to look at this a little more to make to make an opinion. Um, but, you know, alternative, um, this, is a, this is a launcher, right? Yes, it's a launcher. Yeah. So I, I think alternative launchers are, are significant. I think that there's certainly a market for it. And I think that, um, you know, Cyanogen has certainly uh, showed that there is, you know, a compelling reason for people to to switch, especially if you very, you know, in, in their case, there's obviously more than the launcher, right? But I mean, I think that uh, the, the 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 phone that was recently announced, which one was it that had the Cyanogen baked in? Was that the, the Oppo? Oppo? Yeah, the Oppo. Yeah. The, the Oppo, I mean, that just shows to me that like there is, you know, there's a need for, for companies out there to come out with launchers and potentially bake them into other devices uh, right off the bat. So, um, I want to try this one before I, I form an opinion. I'm always interested in trying new launchers. There's been a bunch of good ones in the past, but uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm I'm torn by this stuff. Like, I'm such a Google fangirl. Like, I like plain Android, pure Android so much that for me, it's, you know, using a Nexus almost every day. It's like, why would I use anything else? You know, I'm kind of set in that, in that, in that, I don't know, in that kind of ecosystem and in the way that works. But I think choice is a good thing, and you know, on on iPhone you can't choose you can't choose that unless you jailbreak, and that that's why I love Android so much. You have you have some options. So does this kind of feel a little on. bit like Facebook Home, but yes. just for people who love Google products rather than the Facebook experience? I mean, that's that was the that was the comparison I immediately drew from it. Well, I think I think you know. Um, I've always said, like the day I saw Facebook Home, I said somebody needs to write this sh this you know launcher for Google Plus, Facebook, and Twitter, like like exactly the same experience, but to to kind of uh, aggregate more than one social network, possibly even include Instagram in there, and you know, so in a way, that's kind of what this is, and and I think that it was only a matter of time till it happened. I think it's great, like. I actually think the chat heads and all that stuff is a pretty clever interface. I actually enjoyed using the HTC first, the Facebook phone, for the while that I did. I'm not a huge Facebook user, so I could all I could think of at the time was like, oh, I love this on G+, right? So maybe they're onto something. I always love the idea of something that just does the work for me as long as it works, right? It never does. It never works perfectly. But this this is sort of the Google Now idea for the, for the home screen, which says we monitor how you use the apps and we put them up there. I'm, I use an iPhone most of the time, but I want the same thing for that. I want it to be able to say these are the apps you most frequently use, so we're going to put them front and center for you. And, he, and going even farther with Aviate saying like, oh, you're at work, so we'll give you your work apps here. And when you're home, we'll give you your fun apps. I think that's cool. I just, I get, like you say, Miriam, I want to I try it and see how it works. I, I installed it this morning. I've been playing with it a little bit, and I just turned it on and went to the home screen. It gave me a little tab for general entertainment. Twit Brickhouse Studios. It's all right there. Hey. Tom Merritt's tweet is embedded oh. into it. Uh, all of our, it's our tweets. It's also the NSA. <laughs> <laughs> da -da -da. See, see, the, the problem I have with a lot of these, as as Tom mentioned, is that they, they don't always do things automatically the way you expect yeah, them to, totally. right? The, the reason I like Google Now is that it's something that on my phone I turn on by swiping up, right? By default, Google Now does not interfere with my phone's behavior in any way. 
uh, you know, again, I'm kind of old fashioned, so I'm fully in control of the phone the way I've always had, the way Android is currently done in Jelly Bean, whatever. But I swipe up and all of a sudden I have this entire universe of really cool possibilities through Google Now. And most importantly, it nudges me with a notification when I'm about to miss uh, a meeting because there's traffic on the freeway and I need to leave now. Or when, you know, to remind me that I should need to check in for tomorrow's flight. And, and that's where... I think Google Now becomes invaluable, is that it doesn't get in your face. It's just there. And when it does stuff, generally, it does it right. So that's, you know, I have to play with this, but hopefully they've done, they've done it well. So it doesn't, you know, interfere. Like it doesn't change your phone so much based on context that you're like, get frustrated when you actually try to be productive with it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I get, I get what you're saying for sure. That's pretty much right where I am. I'm on the same page with you. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's finish up with the HTC One Max. Uh, you did a great uh, <laughs> video uh, at uh, tnkgrl.com. Uh, if, yes, if folks I'm going to know... put on my other hat now. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, please my, do. My blogger hat. So, you know, when I left Engadget, I told everyone, obviously, that, you know, I'm, I'm product evangelist at Pebble. So my job is to, to you know, to pimp watches, as it were. But... Um, uh, I, I, there's no way I was going to leave the media world. It's, it's, I spent three and a half years at United and Gadget and six, well, since 2006 writing in that blog that you just put up, uh, Tangro Mobile. And so obviously I want to be connected to the media world by, you know, being on podcasts and, uh, and writing about cool devices when I get my hands on them. And so if you want to bring up my camera, I can show you guys the, uh, the phone here there. Whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. There's a delay. You got to figure this out. There we no, go. We can see it. Yeah. So, this is the HTC uh, One Max, and it's massive. Um, let me show you how massive it is. This is uh, it with the screen turned on. I have an HTC One here, um, and there we go. <laughs> it probably doesn't make sense, like, if you... There we go. I'm trying to... See how much yeah. bigger this is? It's, it's just and the gigantic. HTC One is not a tiny phone, for yeah. those who don't know. It's a, no, so, a five-inch so phone. So here's the thing. So no, it's 4.7 the HTC One, but it has a bit more bezel around it than say the Galaxy S4 or or the G2. I don't know if you guys have seen the LG G2. That thing has no bezel around it whatsoever, almost right. And here's the LG G2, and it's all screen, right? Mm -hmm. All of it, all the time. Yeah, yeah. And so no so it's the same form factor as the HTC One. So here you have the HTC One at 4.7, and the LG G2 is 5.2, and now you have this monster. This monstrosity at 5.9 and 5.9, but with bezel around it, meaning that I don't have a Galaxy Note 3 next to me right now to show you, but a Galaxy Note 3 is 5.7. It's significantly smaller. <laughs> so, I, I mean, look, I here's my takeaway, right? It's an HTC One, but it's gained and lost a few things. The one thing is certainly gained is size, right? It's big <laughs> and it's... Uh, now, not very thick, but it feels thicker than it actually is because of its kind of design. And what they've done is they've tried to scale the HTC One design up, but it doesn't scale well. It scaled down pretty well with the Mini. It doesn't scale up very well. Um, they should have made 5.5 instead of 5.9, in my opinion. Um, now, there's a few things that sh should be added. The, the back cover is removable, like the HTC One for China, which means you have micro SD storage under there, but the battery is not removable. Oh, that's too bad. And because of the removal of back, it, it's lost this kind of really awesome um, fit and finish uh, with seamless fit and finish from the HTC One. So it's lost a bit of that quality and it didn't scale very well in size. And it's really just an HTC One. There's no Snapdragon 800. It's 600 still. Um, that just seems lazy to make the battery cover removable, right? but not go ahead and make the battery removable. Right. So, so and the other thing too is they removed the optical image stabilization from the camera, like they did with the HTC One Mini. So, you know, now you have a four megapixel camera that doesn't have that one advantage that really made it stand out, right? And so it's like I ask myself. Who made these marketing decisions? Really, they're marketing decisions. They're like product decisions. And as a product person myself, I think it's it's a very bad decision making. On, and on, you know, I love HTC. I love. I think the HTC One with the G2 that I showed you from LG are the two top notch phones. I think the GS4 is a piece of crap. Personally, I think it's plasticky. I hate the UI. I think the Note 3 is a really nice phone, um, but. 
HTC really missed the mark. They had an opportunity here to make this a 5.5 inch device with a Snapdragon 800, keep that optical image stabilization and, and make this a true flagship. And they just didn't. But you know? Miriam, they added a fingerprint scanner. Okay, don't even get me started. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I actually, I think, you know, I'm not everybody's had a chance to watch the video, but just, I'm not going to demonstrate here. But what I want to point out is that, you know, on Apple's, you, you just, you just touch, right? right. And mm -hmm. it just unlocks the phone. This thing is one of those swipey things, right? So you have to kind of like swipe at an angle. And if you don't digitize at the same angle as you swipe, then it doesn't work. So it's got a success rate of about, you know, 60, 70%, which is not bad. It's better than most of the swipey fingerprint readers from before. But it's not even in the same league as Apple's. And so to me, if you don't do this right, you're screwed. I mean, Apple's shown it can be done right. If you can't follow suit, yep. don't put that feature on there, right? So it's a very much a disappointment. And and I'm a big HTC fangirl. And so I'm kind of bummed that they just missed the mark by so much. It clearly is that they didn't didn't want to make the effort somehow. And in their situation right now, this does not bode well for them, you know? Yeah, the HTC one is is not their last bet, but it's certainly a big bet for them. And the Max and the Mini are part of that bet. So um, And you know what? The Sorry Mini is a, great, is a great little phone for what it is. It's a little pricey, and they cut down some features, but I think they did it in a re relatively reasonable way. The Max, however, I just cannot recommend. I can absolutely recommend the One. I still think the One is one of the best, if not the best, Android phone, especially the Google Play Edition. The, the HTC One I held up earlier is a Google Play Edition, and that thing is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's surprising to me that they missed the mark by so much. And, and, you know, their marketing people told us, well, you know, it, it, these phablet, whatever, I hate that word, but these kind of yes, phones are do. popular in Asia. And so this is primarily targeted at that market. But honestly, I don't even see any, why do you, would you pick this over a Note 3? Why? Mm -hmm. The Note 3 has a digitized, it might not be as well made, the Note 3, it's still plasticky, but they've improved the plastic build so much compared to the GS4, in my opinion. And the fact that you have a stylus and it's pretty compact for its screen size just works. You know what I'm saying? I don't Bigger know. Bigger and lesser is what it sounds like to me. <laughs> uh, if, if you want it anyway, if you want to just defy uh, Miriam's wisdom, it is going to be on Sprint and Verizon Wireless. Uh, they don't have a release date. They just say by the holidays. They don't have pricing yet for it either. So keep an eye out for that. Let's yep. move on to the randomizer. randomizer. Our live straw poll with the live audience uh, told us lively that 41% of you wanted to hear us talk about the Netflix employee that just raised the bar for awesome, awesome customer service. Uh, this was a, uh, a person who was trying to get help with a video that was messing up on Netflix. Parks and Rec episode, in the middle of the episode, the player would get stuck in what the submitter called a temporal loop. Uh, Tom Cheridar writing about it at Venture Beat. And the Netflix employee uh, responded to the temporal loop comment as, this is Captain Mike of the good ship Netflix. Which member of the crew am I speaking with? So Norm responded, uh, greetings, Captain Lieutenant Norm here. Engineering has a problem to report. They kept on in character for the most part to the end of the uh, the help session there. This is customer service. This is the future of customer service. It's a uh, role, awesome. role playing customer service. I like it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know. I think it's great. You know, it's always refreshing to me. Uh, you know, I'm obviously learning this at Pebble, uh, you know, where, where, you know, where sometimes I have to interface with customer service. Obviously, people know I'm the evangelist, so they ping me and say, my watch is not working or, you know, where's my shipment? And of course, you know, I have no idea, so I have to dig around. Um, but you know, CS is one of those things that if you do it right, you, you're you just full of win every time. Yeah. And, and he didn't and actually Apple's, solve the problem here, right? But the guy went no. away happy because he felt like he got listened to and the person treated him like a human being and they yeah. had some fun. Yeah. And, you know, Zappos has shown that. I think Amazon is a good example of that. I think actually Apple is a good example of that. They're, they're often very quiet, but when you really make enough noise... They're there for you in a major, major way. They've proven this over and over and over again. Um, the antithesis of that being Google, right? Um, so I do I think know. the uh, the Netflix employee was possibly role playing Captain Hornblower, while the uh, the person uh, Lieutenant uh, what was his name Lieutenant Norm was role playing Star Trek. Because at one point the Netflix representative says, "I told you no watching Netflix while we sail through the Bermuda Triangle." <laughs> 
That's a nautical <laughs> reference. You know what? Uh, it's that's the beauty of fan fiction is that you can right. merge it's a crossover. And, and combine things in a crazy and scary ways. Absolutely. So. All right, let's check what's on the calendar, Sarah. All right, I want to say a happy Ada Lovelace Day to all y'all out there. Not to be confused with Linda Lovelace, she's different. No, Ada Lovelace, sure. much cooler. Uh, Ada Lovelace, yeah, it's it's awesome. If you uh, if you aren't familiar with her, she's um, she's a champion for women. Uh, look her up. Today is uh, Yahoo and Intel earnings. Tomorrow is eBay and IBM earnings reports. Also tomorrow, the 16th, GigOM Mobilize conference is happening in San Francisco. And you may be excited about the uh, game Watch Dogs. However, the company has announced it's pushed it to spring 2014. I've Ooh. heard a lot of people on Twitter being like, gosh, I saw I saw it, you know, an almost ready to release a copy and it seemed really done what happened sail on into the emails captain Powell. Message. <laughs> aye aye all right so we got a message from mike in perth australia this is hey tnt i'm probably not the first to let you know this but just in case i am it might be worth noting that you can be a member of the windows phone developer program for free rather than the 19 dollars per year mentioned on the show via the windows phone app studio and he gave us a link you'll have that in the show notes this gives you a developer unlock for your phone which is what you need to install and run update three if you want to actually submit your apps to the store then yes it will cost you $19 per year, but if you're only doing that for the updates, there's no need to pay anything. Thanks for yeah, that, that's uh, Thanks for that, Mike. A bunch of people sent us this mm -hmm. as well. Windows Phone App Studio is what you need to sign up for, not the developer program. A lot of people are like, no, it's free for the developer program. There is a different developer program, which requires $19 a year. If you want to do it for free, Windows Phone App Studio. Thanks for that. Appreciate it, Mike. Don't forget, folks that we have amazing guests, and Miriam Joar just proved it. Thank you so much, Miriam, uh, oh, for Oh, well, thanks us. for having me. I've never done TNT before, so that was kind of exciting for me. Oh, it was a good time. And, You're great. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Uh, you're obviously, uh, as you mentioned, uh, with a new gig there at Pebble. Uh, tell us a little bit about where people can find out more about what you're doing for them. So, you know, I'm the uh, developer, uh, sorry, not developer, uh, product evangelist. We actually have a separate developer evangelist. If you guys are a developer, you can ping me. Uh, I will put you in touch with our evangelist as well. Um, so my job is to, you know, spread the good word, as it were. Um, I can be found at Miriam, like my first name, uh, at getpebble.com. Getpebble.com is Pebble's URL. I know it's a bit odd. But um, also, if you are interested in my take being, you know, a retired Engadget uh, editor. Emeritus, right? Emeritus, yes, on mobile and all things mobile. My blog, Tank Girl Mobile, T-N-K-G-R-L is Tank Girl without the vowels is my Twitter handle. And my blog is called that too. So it's tnkgrl.com. Um, as time permits, I will be posting video reviews like I just did of the HTC One Max. Um, I, I'll have a focus on cars and on uh, camera phones. Those are the two things I'm very passionate about, photography on mobile and and well, you know, I like cars a lot. So, and I, you know, I've I've had a few times uh, written about that for Engadget as well. So I'll try to, you know, as much as I can, and then be on podcasts, hopefully more regularly here on various Twitch shows. So, yeah, keep an eye out for me. And uh, if you have any Pebble questions, you send them my way. You can tweet at me publicly. You can email me as I give you my address, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Miriam. And thank, thank you, you folks out there for Tech News Today subreddit. It's how we figure out our show each day, or one of the ways anyway, technewstoday.reddit.com. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you like watching on YouTube, youtube.com slash technewstoday. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. Email us tnt at twit.tv and give us a call and leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back tomorrow with an all-new episode and an all-new Peter Wells. Actually, it's probably the same Peter Wells, but that's a good Peter Wells, so I'm looking forward to it. We'll see you then.